live from KSAT 12. The 6 o'clock news starts right It's now. very important that we know what the levels are, that the district is doing its best to provide water to our children that doesn't have lead in it. Concerns and questions over lead in the water at San Antonio ISD schools. We've been following this issue for months now after KSAT learned late last year that unhealthy amounts of lead were reported at multiple SAISD campuses. Yeah, we did some digging here at KSAT and found days after the district learned about the health concern, it spent more than $100,000 on a filtration system. The problem, that system apparently isn't able to filter lead out of water. Daniela Ibarra spoke with a parent who has questions for the district tonight. These water bottle refillers are meant to keep kids hydrated. Purchase orders obtained by KSAT show San Antonio ISD bought 125 of them in December of 2022 for just under $115,000. According to the manufacturer's website, the fillers don't have lead filters. In the days before that purchase, we found the district learned 17 of its schools had faucets or water fountains that tested positive for lead. SAISD parent Emily Doherty says she's not surprised. I think that's an incredible misuse of funds. Records show the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality found six of them had faucets or fountains with high lead levels above 15 parts per billion. They said the water from them shouldn't be used for drinking or cooking. Records show the district spent $14,000 to install the fillers at six schools in May of 2022, including Mark Twain, Dual Language Academy, and Fox Tech. Fountains at both schools had readings well above the threshold. Did you know about this? Did you approve this? And if so, why would you do that? We tried to ask Superintendent Jaime Aquino about that at a board meeting this month. So we want to talk to you about the lead in the water. And uh, I'm going to the restroom and then go. Back. Can we grab you afterwards? No, sorry, I can't. Okay. Can you talk to to Laura? Okay. But I can't right now. Okay, because we want to know what, if it, you think it's acceptable for kids. Okay. We also wanted to ask the superintendent when the district plans to remove those fillers. Emails obtained by KSAT show SAISD's facilities department plan to remove them by January 19th of this year. A foreman with the district's facilities services department said because of the weather, the project was put on hold. That's the same week the district shut down after several schools had significant heating failures. Dr. Melissa Hill is San Antonio ISD's Assistant Director of Environmental Health and Safety. In an email, Dr. Hill wrote that she's, quote, disappointed that we were directed to stop. Emails obtained by KSAT show in February of this year, Dr. Hill recommended the district buy water bottle refill stations with lead-free filters. She says it was vetted by the district's plumbing department. As of April, records show those filters haven't been purchased. If you know that you have lead in your pipes, why wouldn't you buy filters that filter lead? Our children deserve better. For KSAT Investigates, I'm Daniela Ibarra. KSAT Investigates first reported on the lead at SAISD campuses in November of last year. If you'd like to get caught up with this full backstory or to share your comments and concerns with us, you can do that on our website, ksat.com. And we are not done following this lead trail at SAISD. San Antonio's next election for mayor is 11 months out, but a third candidate has now entered that race, and he's the first City Hall outsider. Tech CEO Beto Altamirano announced his campaign in a video this morning, and shortly after that, he sat down with our City Hall reporter Garrett Berger for his first on-camera interview. For nearly a year, and, Beto and Altamirano says he's been exploring a run for mayor. I know San Antonio's hungry uh, for a new vision forward. Altamirano is coming from the tech world. His company, Iris, was initially known as City Flag and is responsible for the city's 311 app. He says the company no longer does city contracts, and if elected, he plans to step down as CEO, though he'd stay on the board. But he's also had experience as a political staffer. My background has been always government. It has been politics. It has been public service. And when I started my tech company, it was to solve some of the biggest issues that we face in our community, which are related to infrastructure. He joins two council members in the race, Manny Pelias and John Courage. But even though the election is 11 months and a presidential election away, political consultant Christian Archer understands why Altamirano is waiting in now. With Beto, I think it makes sense for him to get in, to have uh, announce his name. He's certainly going to get media coverage with his announcement. 
people are going to say, hey, who is this guy? Since he's a relative unknown, we talked to Altamirano for a while, more than 26 minutes. We covered everything from his vision for San Antonio to what he thinks should happen with a possible downtown arena for the Spurs. We know that's what you really want to hear about. But it was more than we could fit in this story. But we can fit it all on the web where you can go see it. Just find the story on KSAT.com. I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. This is a dangerous job, and there are people who are willing to give their lives to protect the public. They put their lives on the line, and today the San Antonio Police Department took time to honor them. This morning, a memorial service held at the SAPD Training Academy. Families, officers, Chief William McManus himself attended, paying respects to more than 50 officers who've been killed in the line of duty. It's important for the, for the families to know that we remember them, we'll never forget, and it's important for the department to know that as well. Today's memorial included a 21-gun salute, the sounding of taps, the SAPD pipes and drums, playing Amazing Grace, and a flyover by SAPD Blue Eagle. Take a look outside right now, US 90 at Medio Creek, and you can see there's a couple of cars off to the side of the road. Not sure if this was an accident or if they're having mechanical problems. Kind of paying attention to that, but uh, there are going to be some traffic woes this week. Absolutely. Some big closures you'll want to be aware of. RJ Marquez walks us through it. Well, it's another round of closures for our drivers on the far northwest side, but there is some good news. This closure is not expected to be bad in terms of what we've seen over the past couple of months or so. So just to give you an idea of what's going to happen here. So I-10 eastbound will be closed through 1604, but that is the only major highway that's going to be part of this closure here. The two clover leaves that connect from 1604 to I-10 east, of course, will be closed as well. But we have some good news. 1604 east and westbound traffic that will remain open throughout this closure, which again will starts at 9 p.m. on Friday night and run through 5 a.m. Monday morning. So a lot of people have been asking, what are we doing in terms of progress? What are we looking like right now? Let's go ahead and hear from TxDOT to hear more about that. The interchange is 50% complete and the first flyover ramp will be open later this year. Um, once the ramps start opening, you're going to see a lot of the congestion alleviated and the traffic will flow a lot smoother. And all the ramps um, at the interchange are projected to be open by early 2026. All right, but before we get there, of course, we have to get through the next couple of weekends or so. We do expect some form of closures over the summer months as well. But again, the big thing here, I-10 East will be closed at 1604, but 1604 in both directions, that will remain open. Always remember to plan ahead if you are headed out to that part of the greater San Antonio area. And check out this story on KSAT.com. Have a good one, everybody. Yeah, it'll be messy out there for a while. Yeah, it's going to be. Yeah. Thank you, RJ, for that report. All right. What a refreshing day today. Oh, my today gosh. Was. After that rain, you walked outside. It felt nice, Adam. Yeah, good way to start your Friday with a little bit of rain, some lightning and thunder, and it, it was good. We picked up just under four tenths of an inch at the airport in town. Everything's quiet and clear out there right now. We still have a slight chance of storms later tonight as I'm watching some activity off to the north of us. Closer to San Saba and Brownwood, this action that's between San Angelo and Austin. That's what I'm watching closely because this activity, should it hold together, could drop southward and affect particularly portions of the hill country in the coming hours, basically closer to 9, 10 o'clock. It would be that time frame. And even in San Antonio, there's a slight, very slight chance of some of the leftovers of that making it our way. In a little bit, I'll also talk about what we're watching for tomorrow, where we'll be watching for development and the odds of it coming our way. See you in a bit. All right, thank you, Adam. Texas National Guard soldiers deploying to the border, moving into their new home. That home is called Camp Eagle. And that base camp is a short drive away from downtown Eagle Pass. Our Daniela Ibarra joined the governor today for a look inside. This 80 acre base camp is still being built, but today Governor Greg Abbott came by to check out the progress. 
Thank you, sir. You got it. Enjoy these new headquarters out here. He welcomed 300 soldiers. The governor got a look at some of the spaces they'll be staying in, which includes the dining room. The soldiers staying here at Camp Eagle are serving in Operation Lone Star. That's the governor's plan to stop illegal crossings. Earlier this year, that included a takeover of Shelby Park in Eagle Pass, which is about seven miles away. While the governor says it led to a drop in crossings, some neighbors say they want their park back. We asked the governor about that. Is there a world in which the state of Texas would give back control of Shelby Park to the city? Well, so the, the, the desire to maintain control of Shelby Park is not long term. Uh, that, that's a park that the, the residents of that community uh, deserve to be able to use like they did before. By the fall, officials say around a thousand soldiers will be living here at Camp Eagle and they're going to be moving in phases. The next group moving in in just a couple of weeks at Camp Eagle and Eagle Pass in Yale Barra case at 12 news. Another legal challenge to the state's abortion law has been rejected by the Texas Supreme Court. The lawsuit challenged the state's abortion law over the medical exceptions. Critics have said it doesn't provide enough clarity. A total of 20 women claimed they were denied medically necessary abortions. The court ruled against them, saying the medical exceptions in the law are broad enough. An order written by the court said, quote, Texas law permits a life-saving abortion. End quote. You can read about today's ruling on our website at ksat.com. Now to former President Donald Trump's felony conviction of falsifying business records, reaction pouring in from across the country and both sides of the aisle after that guilty verdict came down. ABC's M. Wynn has more from Washington. President Joe Biden breaking his silence on former President Trump's historic conviction. And it's reckless, it's dangerous. It's irresponsible for anyone to say this was rigged just because they don't like the verdict. The president declaring no one is above the law, his campaign careful not to celebrate. This as the ex-president is slamming his Democratic rival and the justice system. And they are in total conjunction with the White House and the DOJ, just so you understand. That. Despite building his campaign around law and order, Trump, now a convicted felon, found guilty on 34 criminal counts of falsifying business records. It was a rigged trial. Trump's potential vice presidential picks eager to defend the ex-president. Representative Byron Donalds on CNN. He knows that this is a joke and it's a farce, um, although it's serious in nature because what happened in New York was a travesty of the justice system. House Judiciary Chair Jim Jordan of Ohio posting on social media that Republicans plan to demand testimony from Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg and another top prosecutor who worked on Trump's hush money case. It's only going to increase his support. An ABC News Ipsos poll from two weeks ago shows Trump's favorability among his likely voters may go down with this conviction. We saw 80 percent of Trump's supporters say they would continue to support him no matter what, but that's another 20 percent total that would either reconsider or withdraw their support based on a conviction. Some congressional Democrats are pushing for the president and his campaign to ramp up its rhetoric on Trump's guilty verdict. This as Trump could face fines and up to four years in prison when he's sentenced on July 11th. M. Wynn, ABC News, Washington. Still to come on the news at six, if you drive a Hyundai, your vehicle could be an easy target for thieves, but there is some help out there and it's available this weekend. We'll tell you where and how to get a needed safety fix after the break. A group of high school students getting ready to leave the classroom to become the next wave of heroes. Tonight on the Nightbeat, what those students learned about what it takes to be a first responder. It's on the Nightbeat at 10. Some car owners may be riding a bit easier after taking steps to prevent car theft. Yeah, today was day one of a weekend long event put on by the Hyundai Car Company. The car maker installing free software upgrades to some of its cars to make them less vulnerable to thieves. Figures show that Hyundai's is they're one of the biggest brands stolen in San Antonio. People breaking in, vandalizing your car or steaming it. To me, that as an American, that's wrong. Video, uh, videos on TikTok and other social media have had thieves targeting those Hyundai cars. The company says those with the key ignitions as opposed to the push button starts, those are the ones most in need of a software update. Yeah, the event being held at Gus Stadium near Loop 410 in Calabria. It runs from 8 until 6 tomorrow and 8 until 2 
on Sunday. Still time to get out there. Okay, some good rain today. What's in store for the weekend? Yeah, can we be greedy? Can we get some more tonight? Right. Yeah, we can be all as greedy as you want. Thank I'm you. greedy over here yeah. as well. I don't anticipate a whole lot more tonight. Maybe a little bit in the hill country. Let's actually get right to our uh, weather headlines here going forward. There you go, Steve. A minimal storm chance tonight. I'm sorry about that. It's again mainly off to the north in parts of the hill country. Weekend rain. There is some hope for Saturday night. We're going to be watching storms in West Texas that could move our way and temperatures overall mid to upper 90s is what we're looking at. Now you wanted some good news. Check this out. Look at these rain gauge reports. This is good to see. This is from New Braunfels earlier this morning. Chris M in his backyard. That is just under two inches of rain. And look at these reports. Uh, New Braunfels about an inch and a half from early this morning. Not only that, Kerrville, another two inches on top of the two inches a few days ago, and that led to this in Kerrville. The Guadalupe River flowing nicely for a change. And this is from downtown looking at the Guadalupe. Earlier this morning, its flow rate was about 450 cubic feet per second, a pretty good flow rate for the Guadalupe especially compared to what it's been lately. All right, here's a big picture. And notice the activity we had this morning that pushed eastward, even Hallettsville picking up over an inch. But what we're watching now is this action off to the north, closer to San Saba, basically between San Angelo and Austin. This action here, the remnants of it could drift southward. And notice even in parts of Gillespie County, that's where we have a severe thunderstorm watch that's in effect. Now, I think for most of us, we're not going to get in on that, but we need to watch the hill country all the way through about 10, 11 p.m. when some of those leftovers could make it there. Tomorrow, the focus is West Texas again. You know, just like we've been talking about the past few days, activity from North Texas and West Texas that could push our way and be steered our way. We are expecting some development tomorrow afternoon off to the west. And with our steering flow, some of that action, even the leftovers, could make it here by late tomorrow night and early on Sunday morning. That's why we have a little bit of hope for some rain Saturday night. Now, we know the model is showing quite a bit of rain here. However, models are not very reliable in these situations. In turn, we're keeping it at a 30% chance. Now, our overall steering flow, see how it's coming from West Texas? That helps us out. That helps us to get some of those storm, at least the leftovers, if not the actual thunderstorms themselves. But this pattern's going to change in the days ahead. The big blue H, the upper level high, currently it's over Mexico. By next week, especially the middle of the week, this upper level high is going to settle in and actually splits a little bit, and it's going to be more directly overhead by this time next week. And we know what that means. High means dry, and unfortunately, it's going to cut off our rain and storm chances a little bit. Right now, well, look at that. We don't have a temperature reading. There's actually been some communication errors uh, with uh, the FAA and our weather data, so no reading right now from the airport. Uh, 87 in Uvalde, 89 right now in Hondo, Del Rio at 91 degrees and Pleasanton, 91. Temperature-wise tomorrow, a little bit warmer than today, 77 in the morning. 86 at noon, then 94 for the afternoon high temperature. And notice that 20% chance of showers during the day. Basically, an isolated splash and dash could pop up. Don't get your hopes up. Temperature-wise, mid-90s locally. A little bit closer to triple digits along the Rio Grande. But keep in mind, when you factor in the humidity, it's going to feel like 100 no matter what. 30% chance of those showers and storms Saturday night. Keep in mind... We're keeping it low right now because even though the model was pretty aggressive, the models aren't very reliable in these situations. Then a few more opportunities in the nights ahead next week, late Monday and late Tuesday. More rainfall reports at 645. Okay, we love to see them. Thanks, Adam. All right, when you think of the Spurs history, it's one of those milestone moments that you have to look back at. I remember I had the day off, yeah. went to the Dome, sat at the very top, Okay. bought a game ticket that day. Very cool. And... For most of that game, Larry, 
The Spurs didn't look so good. They did not. Then it turned. What were they, down 18 points at one point, right? Then they come back and then shot Elliott, hits that shot on his toes, heels over the out-of-bounds line, and it's known as the Memorial Day miracle. That happened 25 years ago today. Some K-Satters are going to help us go down at memory lane. Plus, the Dallas Mavericks are back in the NBA Finals. Coming up. A lot of our guys first time being in this in this in this light so especially me it's my first time um so we'll be ready man we'll be all right first time took a loss um congratulations to the mavericks um and we'll be back we'll be all right the timberwolves anthony edwards keeping it classy after losing in the western conference finals and big board sports all right, back on this day, May 31st, 1999, the Spurs' Sean Elliott hit a three-pointer that's now known as the Memorial Day Miracle. 25 years ago, his game-winning three with less than 10 seconds to go helped the Spurs beat the Blazers 86-85 in Game 2 of the 1999 Western Conference Finals. When Sean got the ball, he stayed on his toes while turning to shoot was his heels hovering over the out-of-bounds line. And he had to shoot over 6'11", Rasheed Wallace, who was charging hard and jumping up to block the shot. Now the Spurs have sweeped the, sweep the Blazers and then later on beat the Knicks to win the NBA championship. So we asked some KSAT peeps, where were they for the Memorial Day miracle? I was on uh, press row. I'm sitting right there watching every bit of it. And when he hit that shot, the plays absolutely erupted. It was amazing. The moment the Sean hit the shot, and I've never done this before in my life, I couldn't look. I was off to the side in the tunnel where the Spurs run back to the locker room. And all I heard was the thunder. The, I've never heard a crowd react like that. You could feel the sound waves coming from the crowd when Sean hit the shot. As we reminisce 25 years later, we also asked those who were working that night what they believe the impact of the shot had on the city of San Antonio. It really was a turning point for that team and for us as a city because it was the first time that the Spurs and the city were legit in the eyes of the NBA. Things were happening for the city that was just, uh, we had never tapped into that kind of excitement. And I would like to think that was the birth of uh, honking on uh, Commerce Street and Market Street. I, you know, that, that may be where it first all started. Honking downtown, love it. For even more coverage on the 25th anniversary of the Memorial Day Miracle, just go to our website, kset.com, and check out some fun videos on our social media pages. All right, Luka Doncic and the Dallas Mavericks dominated the Minnesota Timberwolves in Game 5 of the Western Conference Finals last night. Luka was on target at the Target Center, hitting shots from all over the court. He shot 14 for 22 overall and 6 of 10 from three-point range. I mean, honestly, it felt like he made more threes than that. Luka was smiling and messing with the Timberwolves crowd. He scored 36 points. Kyrie Irving scored 36 points. Dallas led by as many as 36 points as they beat the T-Wolves 124-103 to to win the series four games to one advancing to the NBA Finals. All right, and Dallas is back into the NBA Finals for the first time since 2011. All right, thanks, Larry. You got it. Our KSAT Q&A is up next. Time for our KSAT Q&A, and what a week it has been, and we're just going to settle on the Texas stuff. We're not even going to get into the Donald Trump stuff. The runoff race is settled. We know who will continue on to the November election here with some of his big election night and post election night takeaways from the quorum report. Scott Braddock, Scott, always appreciate your time. Your Great take to see you all. your takeaway from election night. Mm -hmm. a, a few takeaways. Number one, Governor Abbott has made progress on his quest to pass school vouchers. I do think it's an open question, though. Um, look, the nastiness within the Republican Party is only getting worse. Uh, and in a lot of ways, it's the death of shame. It used to be uh, when Republican candidates and campaigns wanted to lie about uh, their opponents, um, they would use some shady third party group you've never heard of. Texans for this or that would be saying that so and so is the worst person in the history of the world. And now it's just the governor of the state of Texas just outright lying again, you know, about uh, some members of his own party. Um, it, it in a lot of ways was effective, though, and it shouldn't shock anybody that when the governor, who's really a rock star when it comes to the issue uh, of border security and immigration right now, when he's uh, telling these untruths to be nice about it, about the border, uh, and he's saying it about some uh, people in his own party that 
folks believe that because uh, he's very popular among Republicans. A hundred percent name idea. It really works in his favor. Well, and some of these Republicans were, are lockstep with the governor on some of the things he's done on the border and immigration, Scott. Absolutely. All of them. In fact, all of the ones he attacked voted for things like Senate Bill 4 to round up undocumented people and march them back to Mexico. That, of course, is um, caught up in the courts right now, uh, you know, in the midst of a lawsuit. Uh, and you also have uh, the funding for border uh, wall construction uh, down in South Texas that all of these Republicans voted for. Uh, and they, you know, voted for at least about 12 billion of your Texas tax dollars uh, to fund Operation Lone Star, uh, which the governor can't stop bragging about. Uh, so, yeah, these folks uh, were with him on on that they voted with him 99 percent of the time except on one thing on school vouchers they were against him uh, and loyalty up to abbott is never loyalty back down they certainly learned that lesson okay so let's talk about that issue of school vouchers we saw the governor endorse a lot of candidates back in march that he hopes will yep. get that issue across the finish line one of those went to a runoff on tuesday mm -hmm. alan uh, schoolcraft and john kemple schoolcraft mm -hmm. in is a favor of the vouchers he won so I, I know it's kind of a numbers game, setting up a legislature that will hopefully have the votes to pass this, but you know a lot about the legislative process. Is it a done deal if you just have those numbers? You just said you think it's still an open-ended question. Mm -hmm. It is um, an open-ended question. Uh, the governor right now is touting uh, the idea that he has 77 yes votes for school vouchers in the Texas House. I would say that he doesn't, that that even uh, in and of itself is uh, in question. He's using a vote on an amendment last year to take a voucher program out of a larger piece of legislation. He's using that as his baseline for those numbers, and I would say it's an imperfect baseline. Um, but beyond that, even if you believe that there are 77 votes in the House and it takes 76 uh, in the House to pass something, that's a simple majority. Um, that could be wiped out this fall. We tend to forget because it's such a uh, GOP primary driven state, right? We've talked about it a lot, that the election of consequence in Texas is usually the Republican primary, uh, but we do have a general election. Uh, and I would say a competitive one coming up. You've got Donald Trump and Joe Biden going to face off at the very top of the ticket. You've got uh, Senator Cruz and Colin Allred, the congressman from Dallas. They're going to face off for U.S. Senate. And that's going to have some down ballot effect. And I would say, uh, if you ask me right now, which you did, um, it is probably it's a probability that Democrats uh, will pick up at least three seats in the Texas House almost without even trying just because of the larger political environment. And I can count to as many as eight or nine seats that Democrats could take from Republicans come the fall, including a couple there in Bell, uh, in uh, Bear County. Um, that would be uh, John Lujan there, uh, as well as the seat uh, that was just won in the primary uh, by Mark LaHood against Steve Allison. So there's a lot more baseball to play here before we know how this turns out. Yeah, the, the Steve Allison's old district will certainly be interesting to, to watch in November. But mm -hmm. this isn't the first time we've heard Democrats are going to pick up seats and it doesn't mm -hmm. seem to happen. I mean, you would think school vouchers do not seem especially popular across the state of Texas when you talk about mm -hmm. them, but especially in the Kempel Schoolcraft race, which of course is the one that we're most familiar with. John Kempel didn't run on being anti-voucher. I mean, he didn't run on, you know, trying to save some of the rural schools that are in his mm -hmm. district. Does that change now coming into November? I would push back on one thing. We have seen Democrats pick up seats in some of these uh, cycles. Remember in 2018, when Beto O'Rourke was at the top of the ticket, it was mm -hmm. a wild political environment. After that election uh, was over uh, and the you know the dust had settled, we had 12 new uh, Democrats in the Texas House, two new Democrats in the Texas Senate, and two congressional districts in Texas had flipped in Houston and Dallas from Republican to Democrat. Um, in the Kempel race that you're talking about, it's interesting, right? The, these elections were not litigated about school vouchers. I think no. it's very important uh, for people, for you to point that out and for people to understand it. Um, they were talking mostly and arguing mostly about who's going to be the toughest on what on the border because that is the issue uh, that inflames the Republican base the most. And I can tell you, Steve and Myra, I have seen internal polling for some of these uh, campaigns all across the state during these runoffs, and the numbers are almost shocking. Um, if you ask Republican primary voters, what's the number one issue for you? And you give them a list of things, um, more than 50 percent in some of these places, including in the kind of districts we're talking about uh, with Kempel, over half will will say border security and immigration. Um, and the next issue will be so far down, maybe 12 percent will say uh, the economy or school funding or things like that. It, it's it's so outshines everything else as an issue in a primary. But as you know, 
in general elections coming the general election coming up and these these general election campaigns the issue sets are going to change in suburban areas you're going to see uh women in particular more concerned about uh abortion rights and about uh the uh, guns in schools issue uh as well you're going to see uh, other issues come to the fore uh, and just the fact that you do still have quite a few folks out there who even among republican voters will not go along with voting for former President Trump for another term in the White House. So that's going to complicate things a lot, particularly in those suburban districts. Yeah, we talked about that on election night. School vouchers is such a theme for so many of these races, but how important is it to voters in the end? Scott, always appreciate your time. Editor of the Quorum Report, Scott Braddock, thank you for joining us. Thank you all. Have a great weekend. Thank you, Scott. Appreciate it as always. Still ahead, coming up at 6.30, we have you ever heard, have you ever had, excuse me, a hot dog at Costco? Well, we have good news for fans. It's coming up in the buzz. Plus a preview of how San Antonio is celebrating Pride Month, where the fun starts this weekend when we come back. Pride Month kicks off tomorrow, and there are a lot of events this weekend and throughout June to celebrate. And Patty Santos has a preview of the parades and festivities happening this weekend. It is June. That means it is my birthday, and it's also Pride Month, so why not celebrate with a parade? Check it out. There are 16 of these floats that are going to be making their way down the river this weekend. Visit San Antonio is celebrating Pride Month in a big way this Saturday with the free Bud Light River parades and celebration. The party at La Villita is from 5 p.m. to 10 p.m., plus you have two chances to catch the river parade. The barges will make their way down Museum Reach from 6 to 7, and the Downtown River Parade is from 9 to 10. And if you're looking for something just as fun, but on a smaller scale, the Queer Voices Pachanga may be for you. The free event at the Esperanza Peace and Justice Center will have a clothing swap, blessing ceremony, and a lineup of poets, musicians, and other entertainers from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. on Saturday. And if you and your family want to get the blood pumping before heading to the parades, San Antonio Parks and Recreation is hosting a Get Fit SA Pride Hike and 5K at the Wheatley Heights Sports Complex starting at 8 a.m. Or you can head to the Ella Austin Community Center for the Pride Walk and Ride starting at 7.30 a.m. on Saturday. There are many more events happening this June, and we have a full list on ksat.com slash South Texas Pride. Glad to know that June is Patty's birthday month. Oh, yes. Yeah, one of her kids also, birthday in June. Love it. All right, a lot of clouds out there and some storms, but they're not in our viewing area yet, Adam. No, not yet. We're tracking them, but, you know, since we're talking about, uh, you know, birthdays, milestones, right? Mm-hmm. Santa Jim and Karen Flynn, 50 years today. Oh, happy anniversary. Happy anniversary. That's a yep. big one. It's a big one. They're trying to be all quiet about it. <laughs> no, not going to let you. that slide by. <laughs> not going to let it happen. I figured we were on topic, so there we go. And yeah, you see some storms to the north. We'll talk about those and then odds of storms into the weekend in just a bit. All right, keeping an eye on the radar, but also that heat for this weekend, Adam. Yeah, luckily the heat isn't as bad as what we had last weekend when we made it up to 102 for the high temperature, but still fairly warm out there, of course, (laughs) and even above average. Let's go to Authority Radar and take a look at the activity off to the north of us. This is the action that uh, we've been talking about basically between San Angelo and Austin that has been popping up and even one briefly confirmed tornado with that activity just north of Brady earlier, closer to 5.30 p.m. Now, this action is generally moving to the southeast, but you can see these severe thunderstorm warnings are starting to drift into northern Gillespie County and even closer to Marble Falls as well. I do think the brunt of this is going to be sliding to the southeast, but we could get some action drifting into the hill country over the next couple of hours. That's what we're watching in the short term. See how much of that can survive. And even if it's just a few leftovers for parts of the hill country, you look at the rainfall totals this morning, 0.36 at the airport, Bernie about 0.4. Look at Bulverde, a little over an inch. Canyon Lake, two inches of rain. That's on top of the nearly two inches that they had the other night. And Seguin, 
over an inch. Comfort nearly 1.9 inches, just a few miles east of comfort that was measured. So we had the action this morning and now we've got the action this afternoon and early evening popping up here around Burnett to Brady to San Angelo. That's what we're watching for some drifting southward, even if it's just remnants to move our way and the potential for the, some of the severe storms in parts of the northern hill country. Here's our future cast tomorrow. We are expecting some more development in West Texas and just like the past few days, We've been talking about the steering wind. That steering wind can push those storms our way, and that's why we had rain earlier this morning. We got the leftovers of some of the West Texas showers and storms and North Texas rain. We can get the leftovers of that as well. And our future cast is indicating that this activity is going to make it here. Don't trust everything you see on this future cast. We're still keeping it at a 30% chance because these are notoriously unpredictable situations. It's more of a wait and see. Okay, those storms have popped up in West Texas. Now what are they going to do? Do they organize? Where exactly are they going? We'll take every drop we can get because we still have the drought in our area and the extreme drought, of course, Fredericksburg, Comfort, Bernie, Bandera, down toward almost even into Hondo. But this does not take into account the recent rain events that we've had. So hopefully we'll put a little dent in that by next Thursday when it's updated. Upper level winds, Big Blue H, it's centered over Mexico, that steering flow coming in from West Texas. But that changes as we get into next week. Notice the high splits a little bit and it starts to really build over Texas. It's not going to be extremely hot from this, but it will shut off our rain chances, I think, by the middle part of the week. We still have some more opportunities for showers and storms, the leftovers basically from West and North Texas, but the real, the, those little opportunities, I think will get cut off quite a bit. Right now we're 90 here in town, 89 Hondo, 90 in New Braunfels. Tomorrow morning we start the day at 77. Mid 90s in the afternoon. Notice that 20% chance of showers during the day. Brief pop up splash and dash is possible, but I don't think probable. Then we have slightly higher odds by tomorrow night, late tomorrow night, early Sunday morning because of West Texas leftovers. Tomorrow afternoon, close to triple digits along the Rio Grande, but Bernie 89, Bulverde 91, Divine 95, and Poteet 96, the high tomorrow. Mid 90s again on Sunday. Keep in mind, when you factor in the humidity, it's going to feel like it's just over triple digits uh, in the afternoons all weekend long and even into next week. And then Monday night and Tuesday night, we have a few more of those opportunities for the leftovers, as I like to call them, the storm leftovers from West Texas and North Texas. So still a little bit of hope. All right. Thank you, Adam. Moana, hot dogs and bees. Coming up in the buzz. <laughs> to the buzz in Moana making a comeback and she's leading the buzz tonight. Disney's Moana 2 has set a record for the most teaser trailer views. 178 million people watched it in its first 24 hours online. You're welcome. That breaks both Disney and Pixar records. If you plan to see it, you have to wait another six months though. Moana 2 is set to premiere on November 27th. OK, a big day for a kid from Florida. Last night, 12 year old Bruhat Soma walked away from the Scripps National Spelling Bee as the first place winner. Yeah, what does it tie? What does a title like that get you? $50,000, a trophy, a reference from Miriam Webster and more. Soma and another 12 year old contender from Texas had to enter a spell off during last night's competition. Yeah, this was like a down to the wire situation. Yeah. That means whoever could spell the most words in 90 seconds wins. The student from Texas spelled 20 words and Soma, the winner, spelled 29 words. All right, it is no secret food prices have gone up, but if you shop at Costco, here's one thing you don't have to worry about. The chain's new finance executive says the price of hot dogs will remain the same. That is $1.50. The Costco hot dog is a staple for a lot of shoppers. So if that's you, stay calm. Get yourself a hot dog for just a buck fifty. Yes, and relish the moment. Ha 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 ha. It's the onions there for me. I've never had a Costco hot dog. You have never dog. had a Costco hot dog? I know, I, I kind of want one now. All right, save a dollar fifty. 
Nothing on the radar locally, but we're watching that action just north of the hill country, especially moving into Marble Falls and outside of Llano as well. And you see this action, it's pushing to the southeast, but there could be some development and building southward as it as it draws southeastward. So we're watching for the potential of the parts of the hill country to get clipped by even just some of the leftovers of that action. As we go through the coming hours, we'll of course keep a close eye on it. Otherwise, as we go into the weekend, we have a few more shower and storm opportunities, but not a whole lot. All right, thank you, Adam, and thank you for watching the news at six. See you back here on the night beat at 10.